recording started. Okay, I think we're at noon and ready to roll. Um, welcome everybody, it's 12 noon in the mountain time zone. So we're gonna get started with our um, really cool session today, discussing the state of the science on climate and wildland fire. For those of you who weren't able to attend um, part one, part one has been recorded and that's posted on the Fire Lab um, website for your viewing. We had three really great presenters and some um, very engaging dialogue. So check that out. Um, today we'll be delving into climate change specifically related to um, wildland fire. And Natalie is going to give a little bit more of an introduction. But before she does, let me just go over a little bit of housekeeping. My name is Nahalem Clark. I lead science delivery for the Rocky Mountain Research Station, and I'm based at our headquarters in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, so the format for today's talk, uh, or sort of um, session, is that we will have three short talks. Each talk will be you know, 13, 14 minutes. Um, so we'll let you, the presenters roll through their slides, um, hear from uh, three really great speakers, and then we will um, move into more of a Q&A and discussion. We'd love to hear um, how these presentations land with you, what questions they bring up, and um, what else you wanna talk about. So um, once we get to that section, we're happy to take your thoughts and questions in the chat box, or if you wanna unmute, and uh, let us know what's on your mind, that would work as well. Um, you know, some folks get a little bit fired up about these topics. Um, there's a lot going on here. So I will ask that everyone um, kind of adhere to uh, respectful dialogue and um, sharing the stage. So I'll be moderating um, and looking forward to it. So let me pass this over to Natalie to give us an introduction. Okay, thanks, Nahalem. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, so we know that weather is a, is a key driver for wildland fire, both in terms of things like lightning, wind, and moisture uh, that drive ignition and fire behavior. Also in terms of climate effects on fuel characteristics and dynamics, which also go govern ignition and fire behavior. Uh, so we know climate science and the information and products uh, generated by the climate science community are uh, important for wildland fire and wildland fire research. Uh, most of us in wildland fire research um, are probably not intimately familiar with the details of climate research, um, maybe don't re routinely read the climate journals and things. Uh, if you're like me as a researcher outside of climate science, you might get most of your climate science information from summer reports, like what comes out from the IPCC or interpretations of those reports, and maybe an occasional conference or seminar presentation or some featured journal article or something. Uh, so we thought it'd be nice to hear from some experts in the field that are more immersed in, in this science. Um, the past summer, there was a recent article with excerpts from a book um, titled Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't and Why It Matters by Dr. Stephen Coonan. Um, that stimulated some discussion among fire researchers over the state of climate science uh, as it relates to wildland fire. Um, at the same time, the sixth assessment um, from the IPCC is coming out. The first of the reports was released back in August, and I think the final report comes out in January. Uh, this is also all on top of um, heat wave that set new record highs in the Northwest and record setting drought and fire activity throughout the West this past fire season. Uh, we also just set a record high here in Missoula back in mid-November, 62, um, and also saw a late season prairie fire this month uh, over in eastern Montana that destroyed 24 houses and some grain elevators. Uh, so anyway, we organized organize this two-part series featuring experts in the field of climate science uh, and wildland fire to discuss some of these topics. And the goal of the series was really to delve deeper into the climate science, uh, identify gaps in our current understanding, and to facilitate a broader discussion on the topic of climate as it relates to wildland fire. Uh, as Nahalem mentioned, that first panel was held back in October, and it focused on the state of climate science, uh, including observations, global climate modeling, and regional climate. If you missed it, you can check out the recording of the seminar um, at firelab.org. Um, so this is the second panel of the series, and today we'll focus on the intersection of climate and wildland fire, including topics such as fire currents and intensity, fire ecology, and some fire weather. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our three panelists. Um, we have Dr. Sean Parks, um, 
He is a research ecologist with the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute, which is an entity within the Rocky Mountain Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service. He's interested in the relationship between fire and climate, restoring fire as a natural process, and using wilderness as a natural laboratory for studying fire. Sean's also interested in maintaining connectivity for flora and fauna among protected areas as the climate warms. Sean Dern is uh, his bachelor's in environmental science and a master's in geography from the University of California, Davis, and his PhD in forest and conservation sciences from the University of Montana. We also have Dr. Alexandra Seifert, who's a research associate uh, with the Conservation Biology Institute. Uh, she's also been a chief scientist at Virtus Wildfire Insurance Services and, and is an adjunct professor in geography at, the San, at San Diego State University. Alexandra is a research scientist who spent more than two decades analyzing the ecological and social drivers and impacts of landscape change, particularly focusing on wildfire in California and other Mediterranean ecosystems. She investigates how change has occurred in the past, how it is likely to occur in the future, and how different policy or management alternatives may impact ecological and social well-being. She's concentrated uh, intensely on wildfire risk to communities and identifying the best approaches for balancing fire risk reduction with biodiversity conservation. Her research also focuses on the interaction among wildfire patterns, fire climate relationships, land use change and urban growth, vegetation dynamics, invasive species, and species range shifts. And we also have Dr. Cliff Mass, uh, who's a professor uh, in the Atmospheric Sciences Department at the University of Washington. Uh, Cliff has a master's in physics from Cornell University and a PhD from the University of Washington. Uh, Cliff has taught classes on synoptic meteorology and weather prediction and worked on a variety of research topics from Northwest weather circulations and high resolution modeling to the climatic implications of the Mount St. Helens eruption. Uh, Cliff and his students have systematically studied the weather and climate of the Western US, uh, completing over 70 papers on West Coast phenomena, including orographic precipitation, coastal surges, the Puget Sound convergence zone, onshore pushes, downslope windstorms, and various local gap winds. Uh, numerical simulation has been a key tool for his group. Uh, his group now runs the most extensive local high resolution prediction system in the US. Cliff is also heavily involved in regional climate modeling for the Western US, uh, and he's working um, on a new book um, called The Secrets of Weather Prediction. Uh, so welcome to our three speakers. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Nahalem. Awesome. I can't wait to hear from these three. So first off, we will see what Sean has to say. <clears throat> Excuse me, Sean, it's all yours. All right, thank you. <clears throat> How are we? Can you see my slides? Yep, I see your slides and I can hear you. Thanks, Sean. All right, great. Well, yes, I'm Sean Parks and um, I'm excited to talk to you today about fire climate relationships in Western US forests and why it matters and uh, a quick thank you to the organizers of, of this panel for the invite. So I don't have much time. I'm going to get get right into it. A lot of you, I'm sure, have seen figures that look like this in various papers that have come out over the last decade, basically showing that area burned has increased in the western US, or at least in most regions or large regions of the western US. We've done some work as well, my colleagues and I have looked at this as well. We've looked at area burn in Western US forests, sticking straight just to forests. And we have shown, shown that there's been a six fold increase in area burned since 1985. We've also looked at area burned at high severity, and we've seen an eight fold increase in area burned at high severity since 1985. And I'm going to talk a lot today about high severity fire, or I, I will sometimes use the word stand replacing fire. And when I, I just want to define that for you in case just so it's defined. A high severity fire or stand replacing fire in the context of my talk today means that the fire killed all or most trees in a particular area. So it's 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 uh, causes a lot of tree mortality. That's what a high severity fire is or a stand replacing fire. I'm going to get back to this later, but why why it's important to focus on stand replacing fire. So, OK, fire has been increasing in the Western US. Uh, what's its relationship to climate? 
Well, here's a couple studies by John Botsaglu and studies and colleagues showing that uh, we basically have more area burned on a, in a given year when the climate of that year is warm and dry. And so the the uh, horizontal axis here is this they, they call this fuel aridity, but in, in everything I show all the climate stuff I show zero is average. Um, and values above zero are increasingly drier and warmer. And values below zero are increasingly wetter and cooler. So what you see in these in these particular figures is that in the warmer and drier years, we see a lot more fire than in the cooler and wetter years. There's a lot of studies that have shown similar relationships. And here's another study that shows not only area burned, but area burned at high severity uh, for these different climate metrics. For this study on the shown on the left, it was looking at fire season temperature and fire season vapor pressure deficit. If you're not familiar with vapor pressure deficit, it's, it's a metric of atmospheric dryness and it's uh, often has very strong relationships to uh, fire. So each of these dots represents a different year and um, and the the and the climate represent is a uh, fire season climate. OK, so again, what we see is in drier, uh, drier, warmer fire seasons, we have more area burn compared to cooler and wetter fire seasons. You also see a shift that, you know, a shift more or less from different decades or time periods where in the earlier part of the time period from 1985 to 1999, we have less fire and uh, uh, drier, no, wetter <laughs> and wetter conditions and cooler conditions on average. And then as you shift to the, our more recent couple decades, we're seeing a lot more fire and also warmer and drier conditions. This holds for both area burned and area burned at high severity. I want to talk a little bit more about why high severity fire is important. And this is why basically uh, stand replacing fire can serve as a catalyst that shifts forests um, to non forest. And we're seeing this more and more across Western US forests, especially the dry forests in the Western US. And it's it's uh, concerning if you uh, recreate in forests or if you <laughs> if you enjoy it, if you enjoy forests like I do. And the reason why we're seeing these, the reason why we are not seeing recovery back to forest is mostly because of seed limitations. The farther a site is from a live tree, the less likely that site is to return to forest. So um, more and larger patches of stand replacing fire means that more area is limited by seeds. It has can have a prolonged or extremely delayed or um, or a, or never recover back to forest. So let's get back to fire and climate. Uh, I showed this plot on the left already from John Abatsaglu and colleagues, and I want to point out specifically the year 2020. So 2020 was is this black dot up here. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it was, you know, since 1985 or 1984 was the biggest fire that we've seen in the Western US. And when you look at the climate of 2020, uh, it's also was extremely dry. And over here on the on the right shows a different rendition of climate. Uh, it's a it's a plot showing fire season temperature and fire season vapor pressure deficit from 1986 to 2015. Each of these black dots is a different year, so it kind of shows how the how how year to year variation plays out. This red guy over here, that's 2020. So 2020 was, uh, you know, an extreme year in terms of fire activity or area burned, and in terms of climate. When we look into the future, we see uh, where the 2020 climate fits. So on the very right, again, shows a bunch of black dots. Each of those corresponds to various years under climate change or under a global temperature increase of two degrees Celsius. So again, it shows the variation from year to year. And 2020 is there again in a red dot. And so you can see that 2020 is is kind of in the middle of this big cloud. And some people don't like to use this term because, the, but I'm going to use it here, the new normal. 
I think it's uh, it's a useful term given what we're dealing with, and I know that Dr. Seifert's going to talk about it as well. But 2020 appears to be what's looking like the new normal or of the emerging climate. And so when you you know bounce back to the plot on the left and look at the, the huge amount of area burned, uh, and think that oh my gosh the climate's going to you know potentially going to get a lot warmer and drier, it gives a little bit of insight as what we might expect in the future. I'm going to go back in time now and talk about historical fire climate relationships. So a long time ago, basically, this this is a great paper from Jennifer Marlin and colleagues, and it shows what the fire and climate did for the last about 1400 or 1500 years. And using charcoal sediment in lakes, Marlin and colleagues were able to track how much fire there was. It's shown by the red line, shown by the red line over here on the right. Um, and the black dotted line shows climate. Uh, there's climate reconstructions out there for the last several, for the last you know, thousand or 2000 years. And so you could see there's a fairly strong tight relationship between climate and fire. And you can actually see some of the larger climate you know, changes that have occurred over over the last 1500 years. We see the medieval warming period. It was warmer and there was more fire. And we could also see the little ice age where it was cooler and there was less fire. What's really interesting here is where these two lines diverge and they diverge in about about 100 to 150 years ago. And that's often referred to as the fire deficit. Uh, so basically, you know, fire and climate were fairly tightly linked until 100 to 150 years ago. This fire deficit is caused by our removal of fire from the landscape. Although we see, you know, in the news and from the smoke and everything else out there, we see that there's a lot of fire and we think there's a lot of fire. But it's really we only have a short time frame at which we're we're looking at that right kind of our, our lives are even just back to 1900. But if you go farther back in time, there was a lot more fire and with the climate that we have, you might expect there to be a lot more fire than there is. But you know, through the suppression of lightning fires and the um, you know, removal of, of Native American burning on the landscapes, we've removed fire from um, the Western US. And again, it might not seem like it, but we're actually very good at removing fire. I think the st uh, statistic is that only about 2% of, of fires that ignite uh, get big. We actually effectively suppress or remove about 98% of fires. I'll show you another paper here that I really like from er Emily Heyerdahl and colleagues. They, and this is from 1651 to 1990, at these 15 sites, in dry forests of the inland northwest, they were able to reconstruct fire history. And they did so by, at each of these sites, going back and looking at trees. And, and, uh, and if you take a cross cut of a tree, you can actually see when fires burned. So fires did not kill these trees. They damaged the trees and they left a mark. And that mark is called a fire scar. And using these fire scars, you can reconstruct exactly when these fires burned. And they did that at these 15 sites uh, in the map on the left. And I think the results are pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm going to walk you through this top graph, but what this what this means is that greater than six or so seven or more of the sites, seven or more of the 15 sites burned in this 250 year time period. So about every seven years, on average, seven of these sites burned. So we're not seeing anywhere close to the amount of fire that now than we historically had. And I think that's an important, uh, something important to consider as we think about fire climate relationships or contemporary fire climate relationships. The other thing I want to point out, though, is that these trees survived the fires. These trees left, uh, the, again, here's the fire scars. The fires didn't kill the trees. So by definition, these fires were not stand replacing. Um, these trees survived to tell the story that we're seeing now. And then in this right around the late 1800s, we have this giant fire free period, you know, and also you know, referred to as the fire deficit. And when we take fire out of the system, I think it's important to just point out that we, we change the ecosystem a lot. Here are a couple photos 
showing the ingrowth of trees. And this ingrowth of trees has a huge consequence in terms of the severity of the fire when, we, when we're having fires, like the fires we're having now are impacted by this ingrowth of vegetation, biomass, and trees. And I, I kind of think of, of these, this frequent fire that's occurring every five to 20 years is, is kind of like mowing your lawn every week. You mow your lawn every week and it's keeping it low, it's keeping it low. And then you decide not to mow your lawn or whatever for one summer, or you go away for a while, and you come back and you just have a huge, huge mess. And um, so some of our forests have a lot of growth that would not be there if they were, you know, mowed every five to 20 years or experienced um, fire more frequently. This pattern is amazingly consistent using these firing or tree ring studies or fire scar studies. You always see, you see this very frequently. It's right in the 1800s, fire gets turned off. These vertical ticks are uh, fire scars. And the removal of fire is very consequential. This, this paper just came out uh, very recently by a bunch of prominent fire ecologists and forest ecologists. It's worth a read, but, but basically it's talking about the widespread changes in the forest composition structure and the fire regimes. And, um, you know, historically prior, when we had a natural fire regime, there's this natural uh, fire frequency versus fire severity relationship. It's an inverse relationship. Some places like in warm, dry conifer forests, fire was frequent, but was fairly low severity as shown by the horizontal axis here. And now that we've taken fire, you know, kind of out of the system, we've moved these dry conifer forests to a very low uh, fire frequency, but a very high fire severity. And, um, and, and that's one reason why I think we're seeing so much sand replacing fire in our, in our forest right now that was um, very unlikely to have occurred prior to, um, prior to us changing the fire regime in the forest. So even though we've changed the fire regimes and the forest structure, I just want to end on this piece that shows there still is a strong relationship between fire and climate. And we still see that area burnt and area burnt at high severity is elevated in warmer and drier fire seasons. And it's hard to imagine that relationship falling apart in the future as the climate continues to warm. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Seifert. Awesome, thanks, Sean, and um, appreciate that. Just to let you folks know, of course, we were, are recording this session and we'll post that here pretty soon on the Fire Lab website. And um, while um, Dr. Seifert is getting pulled up, um, just if you have uh, questions you want to make sure to ask um, Dr. Parks here in a few minutes, um, go ahead and put them in the chat box or hold on to them and we'll, and we'll get to them. I'm um, very curious to see what kind of discussion this all stimulates. Okay, and Alex, we can see your presentation. It looks great. And great. yep, take it away. Okay. okay, great. And you can hear me all okay all, as well? I can hear you, thanks. Okay, great. So what is normal and why is it new? I'm gonna be talking about why and how fire is changing through the lens of California. So I've been studying fire in California for almost a quarter of a century now. And it's only recently that I've felt like fire is in the news all the time, all year long. It's a hot topic. And part of the reason is that fires has become a possibility all year long. As Natalie was saying, we had a fire in Montana just last week in the winter. And so with all of this talk about wildfire, a lot of the discussion, as uh, Dr. Parks was saying, centers around this new normal. Things are changing. We're in this new normal. And what is the new normal? So I'm going to be talking about this new normal in fire relative to changes in California. I'm first going to be talking about what it is that's actually changing in terms of fire versus uh, several common beliefs about change, some of which are miscon misconceptions. And then I'm going to give an overview of the drivers of change in California and the geographical variability in those drivers and the changes in fire. 
So one of the common beliefs is that fires are getting bigger in size. And this certainly would seem the case in 2017. Uh, we had the largest recorded fire in California history with the Thomas fire. And then in 2018, we had a new fire, the Mendocino fire that, that topped that record. The August fire came in 2020, which now stands as the largest fire recorded in California history. But of course, last year we had the Dixie fire and that was the second largest. So to put this in context, um, what is the size of fires relative to uh, what we have recorded through history? And we found that there have historically been fires almost the size that we have experienced lately. And if you look um, within a hundred year period from 1889 to 1985, you can see in California that there have been um, some very large fire events. But in the last 18 years, we've had 15 of those fire events. So many, many more fires over a much shorter period of time. So the fire size isn't necessarily getting that significantly bigger, but what is changing is that we have a higher frequency of large fire events. One thing to keep in mind though, a caveat, is that some of the large fires that are being recorded recently are complexes. And sometimes these complexes aren't actually a fire that is all within one continuous area. This is just an example. This is the lightning complex, and you can see that it involves a group of fires that are not located all in the same area. So those are all combined together to represent the area burned for one fire. The other um, common belief about the new normal is that fires are becoming more destructive. And of course, there's a good reason for this because within just a period of two years in California, we had um, more, but we had four events that were so large in terms of structure loss that there were approximately 40,000 structures destroyed within just this two year period of time. And if you take a little bit of a step back, you can see the context says, yeah, you know, this there is an unprecedented impact of fires on not only human property, but on human lives. Uh, 194 people directly lost their lives in fires since 2015, but that's not even taking into account um, the number of deaths that may be occurring due to smoke inhalation. Um, and if you were to go back farther in history, you would see this line would be pretty flat, except for a couple little blips. And finally, one of the biggest beliefs is that we've got a really big forest fire problem, right? I mean, even in Southern California, all the news talks about how the latest Cal Southern California forest fires burning near homes. It's holding a, um, a forest fire, the Woolsey fire, the apple fire, they're calling a forest fire. Uh, the thing about it though, particularly in California, is that conifer forest um, is only that dark green area in the map on the left. The most extensive vegetation type in Southern California is non-forested chaparral shrublands combined with other vegetation types like oak wood, um, hardwoods and herbaceous vegetation. And even across the Western United States, there's a lot of area that's flammable and is experiencing fires that is not in the forest. So we recently did a really simple analysis in which we calculated the area burned um, in by vegetation type in California, and we divided it into those fires that resulted in at least one structure being destroyed, in addition to those fires that did not have any structures destroyed in them. And you can see there's extreme disproportionate, um, large amount of area burning particularly those fires that result in structure loss in the shrublands. So if your concern is structure loss, your concern is not a forest fire problem in California. It's a concern about non-forested landscapes. Um, but as Dr. Parks was showing, 
the area burned in the forests of California has been increasing. This is looking at in blue the area burned trends in Northern California and in orange those trends in Southern California. Southern California area burned is remaining actually relatively stable, but the area burned is increasing largely in the forest that Dr. Parks was talking about. So then what is normal in terms of fire? Um, the answer to that is that there is no one normal. Normal, when you think about fire, as I'm sure most of you already know, it has to do with what is called a fire regime, um, which is basically all the characteristics of fire, the frequency, the severity, the intensity, seasonality, etc., that vary within a certain characteristic range. And the flora and the fauna are adapted to this certain um, fire regime within a given region. And there's a wide diversity of fire regimes. In California, it goes you know, everywhere from the naturally frequent low intensity surface fires all the way through desert ecosystems that historically had almost no fires. And in Southern California, fire regimes are being altered in completely opposite directions. Um, I thank you to Dr. Parks for already explaining what's going on in these blue areas, which according to the fire return interval departure, this is the difference in a fire return interval or the average number of years in between fires um, in modern times versus uh, pre-Euro-American settlement. So whereas we've had this um, issue with fire suppression effects in these um, F4 ecosystems, we have another problem in Southern California and in the coastal shrublands where fires are burning much, much more frequently than they used to. Um, and the fire regime is altered in the other way. So what is the role of fire or climate then? I think um, Dr. Parks did a great job uh, talking about climate effects on area burned, particularly in forests. But there's a common belief that climate change is increasing fire everywhere. And a colleague and I, and, I, um, and I decided to break the state of California into six different subregions and in, independently look at the historical fire climate relationships in those different regions. Um, so, you know, all the different uh, climatic variables you could think, you know, you would expect like climate or uh, temperature, precipitation, vapor pressure deficit. And in the montane forests, we found the same kind of relationships you would expect. Um, significant relationship between spring and summer temperature and area burn, precipitation, etc. But in some of the coastal and southern ecoregions, there was actually no significant relationship at all between seasonal climate and wildfire. Um, there was no, basically the R squared of about zero. And there's a reason for this. In coastal Southern California, we've got a Mediterranean climate. So uh, we've got about six months of drought every single year. And at the end of that drought, um, at the, you know, in the fire season, August, September, October, the fuel moisture is extraordinarily low. So the fuel is very brittle, the fuel is very dry, and it's also very hot. Um, you can see on this chart, the low mean temperature in Southern California is the high mean temperature in Northern California. So climate change is not making this qualitatively much worse than it already is. But that's not to say climate change doesn't have an effect. There may be indirect effects of climate change on these shrublands on fire and changing fire. This could potentially be changing in seasonality also via drought and its effects on vegetation change. So talking about vegetation change, this is sort of the shrubland analog to what Dr. Parks was talking about with forests. And we've got a situation in the Southern California Chaparral in which um, there is type conversion from the green shrublands like you see in the background here to invasive annual grasses like you see in the foreground. And it's a result of very short intervals between fires because the chaparral in Southern California responds to fire through either a long-lived fire acute seed bank and resprouting. And it takes about 10 to 20 years in between fires for these species to be able to recover, regenerate their seed bank 
and um, be ready to be able to respond to the next fire that comes through. If a fire comes through before then, it can extirpate the species on the site, open up the canopy, allow annual grasses to come in that are very flammable, thereby promoting a fire grass cycle. So a positive feedback cycle. Um, this sensitivity varies depending on species, um, but drought uh, plays a role not only in contributing to dieback of vegetation. Uh oh, my dog is barking. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, um, that's the first time this has happened to me. Um, but drought also hinders recovery of the young seedlings and re-sprouts. So we've been looking over time at vegetation type conversion and trying to figure out how extensively it's occurring and what are the drivers of it. And we've been doing this through analysis of vegetation type using aerial photographs in the same plot um, across 70 years and looking to see how woody cover has um, shifted or herbaceous cover has shifted. And in these warm areas on the map and the green or um and the reds and the oranges, these are the areas where there has been decline in woody cover and expansion of herbaceous vegetation. So it's been rather extensive. <coughs> but the amount um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but the amount varies by region. And looking at the reasons for why vegetation is occurring. Oh, we looked at a suite of drivers in groups. We also looked at individual ones, but we found that consistently using different modeling methods and looking at different regions in Southern California, short intervals between fires and low soil, soil moisture or indices of aridity were the top two um, drivers explaining this kind of vegetation change. So currently we have a real concern because in this map on the left, you can see that much of the Southern California has already been fairly well saturated with wildfire and we've got a really young landscape out there. So all of these areas in red and in coral um, may be susceptible to repeat fires. And we've got projections of more frequent extended droughts in the region as well. So going back to these fire climate relationships, I also wanted to mention that we did the same kind of study across the United States where we looked independently or individually with regions and calculated the relationship between historical fire activity and seasonal climate. We found something similar than what we to what we found in California and that different regions have different types of fire climate relationships. So it may be that Precipitation is more important in some regions. It may be that winter or summer might be more important, prior year precipitation. So there's different um, types of relationships that tend to be more prominent in different regions. And there's a different strength of those relationships. So in these light green areas, these are areas that we found very weak climate fire relationships. Fire or climate did not explain a whole lot in uh, fire activity. And we did an analysis to understand why that is. And we found that the only variable that significantly explained the difference in strength of fire climate relationships was that the areas that had weak climate fire relationships had much higher human presence. So humans can influence fire a variety of way. They start fires, they put them out, they change fuel type and continuity, but Essentially, human presence can scramble or override the influence of climate in some regions. And of course, um, Jennifer Balch and all um, found that the number of human ignitions is expanding across the United States and in places like Southern California, um, there are very, very few naturally ignited fires. So we've really got a human ignition problem. And I'm going to end with just one example of how humans um, can play a really significant role in driving this new normal that we're looking at. Uh, we just did a study where we looked historically of, um, since 1948 at a range of variables explaining the area burned in Santa Ana wind driven fires. Um, most of the large fires in Southern California are driven by these um, fane winds, these hot, dry, very strong 
seasonal winds. And we found a couple things that are really interesting. One thing over the time period is that 75% of the time there's a Santa Ana wind event, there's no fire. In other words, in Southern California, these events are regular and they're frequent, and they don't necessarily mean that there's a fire risk. Um, instead, the area burned by Santa Ana wind-driven fires was best explained by the number of ignitions on that day and the wind speed of the event. Um, other variables such as other weather factors like temperature or relative humidity on the day um, during that event were um, not significant, nor was seasonal climate. So in summary, what is normal and why is it new? Um, there is no one normal. It depends on what fire regime you're in. And fire regimes are altered differently for different reasons. In forests, fire suppression and fuel buildup, as well as seasonal climate change is important. Whereas in shrublands, ignitions and drought and vegetation change may be more important. Um, there is an increasing number of large fires across California. There are unprecedented human impacts from fires, but in California, most of the structure loss is not in forests. So my final point is it's never any one factor and one size does not fit all. Next. Thank, Thank you, Alex. Alex. That was that great. Was great. I think I your think dog, dog is as upset as the rest, the rest of us about, about invasive, invasive annual drought. Annual. <laughs> so, so we're all we're upset all about it. it. It's fine. That could be hard to focus, but um, we're all just upset about it. So thank you for that presentation. I all almost right, stopped, right. but I I thought, well, no, I got to just keep going. <laughs> You're, you're absolutely fine. Thank the you. The show must go on. Yep. Okay. So let's roll on to our last presenter, Cliff Mass. And Cliff um, persevered through issues with teams. And here he is like a pro um, presenting. Um, Cliff, I can see your slide and go ahead. And can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really thank you for being invited to talk here. Um, I'm going to give a 10,000 foot talk here. Um, I'm going to talk about some big picture items and and perhaps my talk will, would be similar to what Steve Coonan would have said if he, if he was here, especially since he stimulated this thing. For a number of reasons, the relationship between global observed global warming and Western wildfires is obscured and it's confounded by a number of factors. And I think we are well advised to think about this when we try to find a connection. I'm going to give a few reasons why a few obscuring issues here. Number one, the extensive areas of forest and land surface have been greatly altered in the past century, increasing flammability. That is a big change that has happened during the last century, and, se and several other speakers have mentioned that. Our forests are denser, smaller trees, there's more competition for water, and there's an increased tendency to burn catastrophically. So. The surf, things have changed radically at the surface. So if we're looking at a correlation between, between climate and wildfire, we have to keep this in mind. Uh, reason two, it's been mentioned a little bit here, there's been a huge influx of highly flammable invasive grasses across the region. And that includes cheat grass and others. I mean, the, 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 this map here shows you the, the non-native plants per acre, but in many areas, there's been this huge invasion of this of this very flammable grasses, and it's certainly changed the fire the fire situation up in the northwest. Reason three, we've heard about it. Fire suppression policies have changed dramatically over the period we're trying to do this correlation with climate. Before around 1920, there was no suppression or a little suppression. Then increasing suppression from 1920 to 35 then active suppression from 37 to 40, then transition uh, to 70, and then transition to less uh, uh, of suppression. We can see here, here's U.S. forest area burn from 26 to, to 17. You can see it. You can see the change, the drop in no, the number of acres burned, relative stability that, that increased after 1970. Um, in Oregon, you can see this very carefully. This is from the ODF has fire history over, over the last century. A lot of fires back in the 19 teens, 20s, then the drop off and then increase more recently. Another thing we have to keep in mind, especially for places like California, there has been a massive increase in population on the, over the area. 
a lot more things to burn, like like homes and, and businesses, and a lot more ignitions. We can't forget this is an absolutely huge increase in population that has occurred dur during the last 70 years. Another thing to keep in mind when we're trying to do climate correlations is that human ignition has become dominant in many areas, changing not only the amount of ignitions, but also the seasonality as shown by this, this figure over here, uh, lightning, which was the, which was the original uh, initiator, except for Indian, Indian ignition, whereas mainly in the summer, human ignition now is year round. Um, in fact, it's gotten even worse than that. We, we not only have things like electrical systems starting fire, now we even have arson as a major issue. Another thing to keep in mind when we're trying to do this climate comparison with wildfires is California's precipitation has been intermittent and episodic. The, over the last hundred years, there's really been no major large scale trend in precipitation, but we have had episodic periods where it has been wetter. And so it's problematic if we take a shorter period, well, the number of studies have done from the 19, from 1980 on, you end up with a trend downward of precipitation that doesn't really characterize the precipitation over the last hundred years. Um, another interesting thing to keep in mind, and it was mentioned uh, just now by Dr. Seifert, when is dry, dry enough? There's the potential for fire ignition may be very nonlinear. And so, you know, once you're dry, either during the year or whatever, if you're dry enough, perhaps higher temperatures don't have much of an impact. So there could be a nonlinearity in this relationship. Something that's dear to my heart is that wind, particularly strong winds, is critical for fast growing large fires. But most of these climate studies trying to uh, trying to correlate a climate with fires, ignore it. So strong winds have been important for almost the majority of the major fires we've seen recently. Um, the Western Oregon fires of 2020, those were record-breaking easterly winds. Um, that should be the wine country fires of 2017, strong winds, the Camp Fire, the Thomas Fire, many more. And we know the wind systems that are associated with these downslope easterly winds, Diablo winds in the north, Santa Ana winds in, in the south. Now, the interesting thing is that there's no evidence that such winds have increased. Not at all. And so there's a number of papers, including some that I've worked on. That it, but it's even more interesting than that. Climate models suggest that as the planet warms, there'll be decreasing downslope easterlies that are associated with many of these fires. So global warming can actually work against fires. So the wind issue is one that's really important and I think has been neglected. Um, and, and of course, there's the stuff in the north and there's a, there's, a, there's a literature now on the Santa Ana winds wind weakening under global warming. Um, another thing that, that's interesting to think about is changing precipitation can work both ways to increase and decrease fires. So, you know, more rain can moisten fuels, lessening fire danger, but more rain earlier in the season can increase growth and or the previous year and enhancing fire danger. So dry conditions can lead to less fuels, especially in chaparral and the grasslands. So it's not clear how global warming, if it does affect precipitation, will influence grass development and therefore fires. This may be a more controversial part of this talk. The observed global warming signal in California is really quite modest. Uh, if you look at, I'm, look, I'm showing here the whole state, but I can show you subsections. There's been about a two degree Fahrenheit warming over the last century, okay? So it's warming and we're probably associated with, with, with a lot of it, but it's modest, only about two degrees overall the state. And in fact, if you look at the heterogeneity of, over the state, uh, some areas are not warming much at all, especially some of these areas are where some of the big fires have been. So in many areas of California, the warming has been relatively minor. So it just it just shows you that there's a weakness of looking at these aggregate over the whole Southwest, over the whole state. That's a problem. So combined with little long term trend in precipitation, is it reasonable, I ask all of you, to suggest that 
the modest temperature trends over much of California with very little overall precipitation change is the, is what's causing all, all the recent large change in wildfire or wildfire numbers in acreage. Um, this one I don't have to mention much or anymore, the historical perspective, the burned acreage used to be much, much more. So you know, we, we can go back 100 years or more, and, and several people have shown that already. So in the final part of my talk, I want to stress that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. There have been a, several papers, and quite, I mean, there's a lot of papers that have gone through this logic chain. The region is warming. The warming is mainly due to anthrop anthropogenic greenhouse warming uh, forcing. Well, that may be true. Vapor deficit has increased because of the warming during the warm season. Fires, the acreage and numbers are increasing. Therefore, global warming enhances wildfires. That is an assumption that correlation and causation is the same. And this logic has problems. Most of the papers that have made these claims have not considered a number of the confounding issues that I mentioned earlier, the changes what's happened at the surface, for, for instance, the changes in winds, et cetera. So correlation does not mean causation, and we have to be very careful. So the bottom line of what I've said so far, and, and I've been mainly talking about the observed period, uh, no paper in the current literature provides convincing evidence that global warming is playing a dominant role or even a significant role in the increasing trend of Western wildfires. And this is something we may talk about. And this issue about uh, global warming and wildfires, the issues are compounded many times over when we're talking about global, produ global warming uh, producing big trends in, in wildfires in the future. First, a lot of these studies assume relationships between wildfires and, and, and temperature and, and humidity or VPD or drought and seas. They are, they're assuming the relationship that they derive from the historic period. But I mentioned that there's all kinds of problems with that because of confounding issues. Many of these studies that are looking to the future make use of climate models that, using, that use un, unrealistic greenhouse gas forcing. Many of them use RCP 8.5, which is basically unrealistic. It produces too much warming and too fast. And that's particularly true at the end of the century. Okay, let me keep on going here. So the bottom line of all this is that there's substantial uncertainty about what has happened in the past and certainly what's going to be happening in the future. There's little convincing evidence at, at this point that global warming, forced by mankind has had a significant impact on the number and, and frequency of Western wildfires. Now, global warming will be significant during the century. Uh, there's no doubt about that, but it's probably going to be along the lines of RCP 4.5 or 2.6, which will produce much less warming than the RCP 8.5, which is used right now. So, uh, so my, my worry here, my warning, I guess, this is what Steve Coonan might say, the impact of, on Western wildfires of such, such human-caused warming is highly uncertain. And with that, I will end my talk. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Cliff. And you couldn't have teed up our discussion any better. Um, thanks for that presentation. So let me project a couple of questions that Natalie and the seminar planners um, teed up for the panel to react to. And it just so happens that the first question, I think, um, allows kind of a perfect opportunity for um, Dr. Parks and Dr. Seifert to respond to. Um, so the two questions we, we um, are interested in the panel talking about are, how much are Western fire regimes driven by climate change versus versus other impacts? We heard from um, Dr. Mass that it's um, pretty uncertain. I'd like to give an opportunity to Alex and Sean to respond to that question. Um, then why don't we go to some chat box um, discussion and questions, and then we'll get to the second question, which is what do you think we should expect in the future in terms of climate change versus other human impacts on fire regimes in the West? So 
um, those are sort of some guiding questions. We'll sort of see where this discussion goes, but let me take down um, that slide and just let the presenters keep their cameras on. So why don't I go to Sean and then Alex to sort of address this um, question about the relationship between um, climate change and what we're seeing with fire and kind of detangling these these other pieces. Yeah. Um... Yeah, great question. And you know, the the I think one of the issues with fire is that we as people and the media and different advocacy groups or whatever try to dichotomize the issues the you know, it's fuels versus climate or whatever, you know, and, and it's a much more nuanced, I think, response for one. And number two, it's also nuanced based on let's say even the ecosystem or the geographic area, like Dr. Seifert was saying. And so for example, when you talk just about fire regimes and how that's affected by climate or climate change, it's important to recognize that the two main components of fire regimes are fire frequency and fire severity. And just those two different components are going to have a different uh, relationship with climate. So I'll, I'll go on with that and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Seifert. But in for example, I would say that climate has a huge, a much more, or a much greater influence on area burned and fire frequency than um, the influences on fire severity. So, climate, you know, all things being equal, you know, we're we're suppressing all these fires and a lot of things that Dr. Mass talked about. We still see a very strong relationship between climate and fire area burn. So it's, you know, I I personally think it's reasonable to exclude or uh, conclude that that relationship will hold in the future. Um, but fire severity is climate plays a role, but also fuels does play a role and fuel fuels buildup plays a role. And I'm mostly talking about uh, forests here. OK. Um, so so to simplify everything into fuels versus climate is I think is an oversimplification and we as scientists and media and science communicators need to do a better job of of describing the nuances and the differences uh, of these different factors on different components of the fire regimes and in different geographic areas. It's, it's just not it's, it's just not that simple and I'll pass it off. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Alex, let's go to you. Yeah, I I agree with what Sean just said very much in that uh, people tend to come up with dichotomies and tell a simple story because it's very appealing to have a simple story and to blame it on one thing or the other. And I think, you know, I, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Mass's presentation because it is so complicated. Um, it's often many different things at the same time and there are interactions with different factors. So climate directly affects vegetation. Um, climate is causing species range shifts in and of themselves without even altering fire. But climate is also altering fire and vegetation alters fire and then humans alter vegetation. And also speaking with what Dr. Parsh was saying is that looking at area burn versus ignitions, for example, all fires have to have an ignition to be able to move somewhere. But in the studies that I've done, I find that the strongest correlates with the location of ignitions is completely different and sometimes reverse is what the correlates are for area burnt. And so untangling all of these things, untangling fuel versus climate versus humans versus weather is just very complicated. And, um, and you know, in the geographical variability part, I think is absolutely critical. Uh, being in California and being someone who studies shrubland ecosystems, um, I am often, you know, people often try to use paradigms for forested landscapes and apply them to shrubland landscapes and they're just not appropriate and vice versa. So um, that's, I guess, my long-winded answer is that it's very complicated and um, that we need to focus on the largest problem and priority in a given area. So as um, Dr. Mas was talking about, I mean, 
um, invasive grasses and invasive species in Southern California, that's really important. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Dr. Mass, do you have anything else to add? I felt like your presentation really addressed this question, but I just wanted to give you a minute in case um, you have anything to add here. Sure. Well, I'm and I and I just want to just play off what Dr. Seifert just said. Uh, a lot of the studies have looked at the aggregate west, you know, large areas, and looked at the aridity of a large area uh, ver uh, versus fire. But there's so much heterogeneity there. And I think there's a real problem in trying doing these aggregate studies of aridity versus, you know, uh, acreage burned. It, I think I think that I think that's a problematic approach. And I think and a number of the studies have followed that. Great, thank you. Well, thanks to the three of you. So why don't we go to the chat box for a few minutes, grab some questions there. Um, I see a hand raise. We'll get to that here shortly. Um, so Lauren Atwood has a question here. Um, let's see here. His first one. Uh, it almost seems like the composition structure of the tree is different comparing with fire to without fire. Wonder if this changed the quality of the wood. Maybe it used to be higher quality in the past. If we use this higher quality timber for building materials, would it produce less dust? last longer, et cetera. And I don't know um, if any of the three of you have any comment here. This may not be, you know, wood quality might be, might not be your area of expertise, but would anyone like to respond to this question? Uh, not my area of expertise yeah, for not sure. Not mine. <laughs> but, I, but I do know that one of the, um, one of the reasons that uh, the, you know, people wanted to put out fires or initially put out fires was because that the fires did cause these fire scars on trees and did make at least the lower part of the tree less suitable for timber. So I don't know about other parts of the tree and, and quality and what have you, but so I think we should all punt on the rest of that. Yeah, and it's possible some of our audience members may have some leads um, there for Lauren related to wood quality and fire. So thanks for the question. Um, we're going to go next to Brian Lamb's question. So Brian had to hop off, but he's going to watch the recording a little bit later. So I want to make sure to grab his question. Um, and I think I'll send this to Alex first. In terms of stand replacing fires, do shrublands have a similar issue? Will shrublands grow back differently? Oh, uh, yeah, excellent question. Um, the something about i was just telling somebody this yesterday who was not aware of it is that the natural fire regime for chaparral shrublands is high severity crown replacing fire um the natural fire regime is that the fire top kills all of the vegetation and recovery is um occurs and without any disruption to the fire regime typically the stand returns to its pre-fire composition and so um, high severity fire is beneficial in chaparral. And in fact, um, it helps to kill the grass seed bank. So uh, one issue with frequent fires is if you lower the fire intensity in chaparral, you actually um, have a chance of not killing the grass seed bank and furthering this vegetation um, type conversion issue. So once again, it's kind of the flip relationship as it is to the forests where high fire severity and crown fire is an unwanted and incompatible ecological phenomenon. Thank you. Um, Sean or Cliff, would you like to add anything? No. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, I am going to skip over Lauren. You had another sort of um, long question. I think uh, Karen Short had sent you a paper on that. I'm going to try to get around to the audience as much as possible. So, um, wondering if any of you want to respond to Mark Finney's comment about um, sort of not a lot of discussion about indigenous burning and kind of the amount of fire. I think, you know, Sean, some of your early slides talked about a change in the amount of fire, but can we can we address that um, sort of comment head on? Who'd like to go first? I I can go. Great. Um, 
yeah, good question, Mark, and is becoming uh, a increasingly uh, important factor to recognize. Um, you know, the, the, I, I did mention the fire deficit that started around 1880 or the late 1800s, and a large chunk of that fire deficit is, you know, the removal of indigenous burning from the landscape. So fully agree. Yes, that happens, um, you know, in addition to the direct suppression of fire, of, of lightning ignited fires. So I think that those are those are definitely two factors. And, you know, the whole thing got me thinking about, you know, what's more important to fires? Is it fuel versus climate? And the answer is it's humans, right? I mean, <laughs> we we took out the human ignitions and and we took out the natural ignitions. So we have um, <laughs> probably the biggest influence on fire regimes, or at least area burned, more than climate and more than fuels. Um, that's yeah. that's just kind of a something I thought about just as we were going through all through all this. Thanks, Sean. Anyone else want to add to that? I would um I would just add sort of a corollary. It's it's not the same thing, but uh, the discussion of grazing. Um, you know, grazing has had a very long influence on fire regimes and the removal of grazing can um, greatly alter fire regimes. I, you know, it makes me think about Mediterranean Europe in which traditional um, land management that involved grazing has, has now greatly shifted fire regimes because it's no longer keeping the fuel down. So um, it's just one other factor that is contributing to this complex mess that we've got going on with fire. Thanks. Thank you um, both for um, addressing addressing that point. So let's see here. We have a hand raise, so we'll go to that question or comment. And then I had a pre-submitted question that I want to get to. And then why don't we loop back to the second question, the second guiding question that um, Natalie had posed. So no need to keep track, but just sort of providing a roadmap in terms of where, where we're going with the discussion. So let's see here. Looks like Ned Nikolov, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon, rather. Uh, I have a question for Cliff Mass. Um, this is a little bit related to the climate more than to the to the fire, but um, there has been a number of uh, uh, papers published, uh, probably over a dozen that I know of, for the last like 10 years, showing that the since 1980s, since we have satellite observations, the um, uh, cloud cover has decreased both globally and regionally. And as a result of that, uh, the amount of solar radiation reaching the surface has increased. And the numbers that I've seen, they suggest that this, this amount of measured, uh, also this is, has been measured on the ground by sensors on the ground, not just from the satellites. But uh, this amount of increased solar radiation for the last 40 years or so, uh, it seems to be enough to explain the entire warming that we have observed for the last 40 years. So, uh, so what's your take uh, uh, on on this issue with the clouds? And it's also known that climate models have an issue of correctly simulating the cloud cover, the cloud albedo changes. Right. I am not with studies that suggest that the warming can be completely explained by changes in solar radiation. So, uh, I, I I would be interested if you can send me some of those those papers because I I have not seen that. Uh, but one thing I will agree with you on is that the climate models have real problems with clouds. I, I, I just heard a, a presentation about that here in the department. Substantial problems with low clouds, for instance, and, and also light precipitation. So that's another reason to be, be very careful about taking the climate models as the gospel truth. They, they have a lot of problems with precipitation and clouds. Thank you. Um, yes, the paper that I've seen, they don't conclude that the warming can be explained with a cloud cover change and cloud albedo change, but they do show the numbers that, that kind of suggest, you know, if you know how sensitive the, the system is to changes in solar radiation, uh, that's what I concluded. But yes, you're right. There's no paper that explicitly right. states. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think there was. But, yeah. but anyway, send, send me the papers that, you, that you're looking at. I'd be happy to look at them. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the question and, and thanks, um, Cliff. 
Okay, so I'm going to go back to the um, pre-submitted question, and um, here it is. How, and I, I'm, I'm going to probably go to Cliff first. How do our current best global climate models do at retroactively predicting the global warming event of the early 20th century? Right. Well, I mean, that th this is a sensitive area. Um, the models are, for good or for bad, tuned to match the 20th century. And so they can duplicate pretty well the variations uh, with changes in, in greenhouse gases, changes in aerosols. We can get a, a change in temperature from the models that look like reality. But I think we've got to be very careful there. There are all kinds of parameters that are tuned to, tr to make sure we can do that. So that's one of the issues. If we've tuned for the, the last century, is the, are the models reliable for going into the future? That's a, that's a very important issue. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more um, questions in the chat box. Let's see here. This first one is from Brian Potter. Well, let me see here. It looks like more of a comment, actually. So um, I'll just read it off and see if you want to respond. I do want to thank Dr. Seifert for noting the issues with co complexes. They're administratively based and they're not the same as single point ignition. So thanks for bringing that up in your talk. They make analyzing daily growth on fires and how the weather influences them very difficult. So thanks for that additional comment, Brian. Um, thank you for the comment. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. Let me jump back up because I missed a question from Patrick Freeborn. Hey, Patrick. Um, hotter, drier, and windier conditions increase the potential of a newly ignited wildfire to grow large. Can anyone speak not only to the trend in annual wildfire acreage, but trends in the interannual variability of burned area? So that's in the chat box. Um, I can read it one more time if needed. Who'd like to um, start on that one? So this is about trends in the interannual variability of burned area. Uh, okay, Patrick, I don't quite understand what you mean by trends in interannual variability, but you know most of these studies show um, you know, not just trends through time, but they do show, um, you know, they, they, they explicitly show how much area burns each given year. I, so I guess I just don't understand the question. Right. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, um, the variability in area burned, I'm not sure has really changed. Um, you know, I think the trend in area burned is changing differently in different regions, like I had mentioned, but I'm not sure if there's much difference in the variability um, from year to year. At least from from the records that I've looked at, it seems like, you know, I mean, there's oscillations and I don't think there's a change in that standard deviation, but uh, don't don't quote me on that. You could quote me on that, but I may not be correct. So. <laughs> Well, if I just could comment, just from the meteorological perspective, there really has, there's no century long change in variability. If you look at the, I had some of the graphs right there. Um, and, and, and looking forward, that's, this is one of the issues with the climate models. They're not very good at getting internal variability well. So that's an area that they do kind of fail in. So that's something to keep in mind. Great, thanks. And Patrick, if, if that, um, okay. Laugh out. Okay, lol. All right, so we'll move on here. Um, just a comment here um, from Helen Smith about domestic grazers um, and uh, wild grazers. So thanks for bringing that up, Helen. Great point. Okay, so um, from Kara in the chat box, when thinking about contemporary forest tree volumetric losses from wildfires, how does this compare with the gain of tree encroach? spaces due to fire suppression. Are these gains and losses happening in the same spaces? These are good questions, um, folks, and I'm not quite sure who to send them to, so I'm going to let our panelists um, raise their hand. 
um, to answer these. Yeah, I mean, that's all about um, sort of like carbon tracking, right? Um, you know, there's there's been increased stand density in a lot of these forests and in recent years, especially in um, the northern part of the state, there's been a lot of fire. I don't know if anybody's actually tracked, um, you know, from a carbon perspective, what has changed, but, you know, clearly there are potential for the high severity fire to result in net carbon loss over time if there is no recovery. Um, Dr. Parks, maybe you have an answer. You you work more in the forested ecosystems. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's it's difficult to answer that. I think that's probably a question for FIA, the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, to figure out. But in terms of spaces, I'm thinking like climatic space. The encroachment is probably happening in a different climatic space than I mean, because it's it's encroaching into non-forest areas. Um, than the current forested area, which has a different climate space. So those are occurring in, in different areas. It's hard to know if they're going to be offset entirely, if that's what you're, which I think is what you're asking. OK, anything to add, Cliff? I, no, not, not. OK, great, sounds good. <laughs> so um, there's a little bit of discussion here in the chat box about complexes being more complicated. Um, that was. That was a nice riff there, Karen. Um, so tell you what, we have a little bit, we have about 10 minutes or so of this session left. So I'd like to go to our second question um, that Natalie set up as a guiding question. And I'm gonna put it in the chat box as well. So when I read it, people that are visual, like me, um, have something to refer to. Oh, it's gonna look terrible in the chat too. Um, okay. So the question is, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, doesn't that look great? Yeah, it looks great. Um, yeah. So I can't what read do it. you think? I'll read it off and then I'll retype it. What do you think we should expect in the future in terms of climate change versus other human impacts on fire regimes in the West? So with your permission, panelists, I would really love to go around and maybe this is how we'll close out the session unless there's other questions, but just sort of like what, you know, what are the tea leaves telling you? What do you think we can expect and how do you pick apart climate change versus these other factors? So I'll start with Cliff and then we'll just kind of go around. Right. Well, so, so you want to know how will climate change or how will it affect fires? You want the latter, right? Yes. Uh, yep. On fire regimes. Right. Well, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is human ad adaptation to climate change. And so what we don't know is what will we do about forest management? What, what will we do about that? What will we do about policy of, of, of home? Will homes be more fire resistant? Businesses be far more fire resistant. Uh, will we change the electrical infrastructure um, so that it's less pr prone to burn? So there's, that's a whole element there of human adaptation to climate change that could radically affect the answer. So uh, I don't know how we answer that. I mean, the, the on the climate side, I can I have a pretty good idea what what's going to happen, and, and and I think something. Uh oh, I lost yeah. Cliff. It looks like Sean and Cliff are both frozen. Just went, I just went blank. But okay, okay. continue back. on. Okay, so anyway, so we will slowly warm. Precipitation is uncertain, and so in some ways, that's that that'll be better. That'll may help fires along, but the human adaptation, I think, is a tremendous unknown, and that could change the whole story. Great, thank you, Cliff. Um, Alex, I'll go to you, and then Sean will will end with you. Okay, I can't help it, but as soon as I read that question, I was thinking of. The doors, the future is uncertain and the end is always near. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really, I don't, I don't think any of us know. And it's kind of like what you were saying, Cliff. I mean, anyone who claims to know may be a little bit delusional. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think that vegetation change is really important 
Um, and I think it might be one of the, and I don't just mean fuel accumulation. I mean, like in the entirety with, with the, you know, there's the key, you know, like CO2, what's the CO2 effect on vegetation um, and species range shifts? So it's, um, it's uncertain. I do think in the immediate future, because I've been, um, I've been serving on the board that oversees uh, the utilities. I think that the power line and the utilities in California are really getting their act together. And I think the weather stations that they have been installing are going to lead to greatly enhanced situational aware situational awareness. And I think that's a positive. Um, so I think that you know, there I see some really positive signs in terms of the human adaptation that, that Cliff was talking about and that, you know, there is a strong push to understand more than I've seen before. And there's a strong push to try to do something about it. The thing is, is that a lot of times you have to understand the trade offs between ecological values and human values and community safety. So. That's my answer. Thanks. Great. All right, Sean, you're on. OK, well. You know, again, we're talking about fire regimes. There's different components of the fire regime. And also I'm going to specifically refer to forests because that's what I've studied mostly. Um, again, I do feel like and I think the scientific evidence supports that uh, climate or climate variation or climate variability is a, is a huge driver of area burned and it's hard to see that changing. Um, in terms of fire severity, uh, Dr. Mass had some great points about we can actually change the outcome of that component of the fire regime for using other tools, right? We have the ability to say, um, implement prescribed fuels and do restoration treatments to make our forests more resilient to the standard placing fire. And again, standard placing fire is one of the one of the types of fire that is what catalyzes these shifts from forest and non-forest. And Dr. Seifert was just talking about that. So so humans can have different influences on 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 the severity, I think that and they don't have as strong of an impact on area burned, unless of course we decide to light a lot more fires and let a lot more lightning ignited fires go and then we actually can have more fire, then we might be shifting our ecosystems to that uh, fire frequent, more frequent fire, but lower severity fire. By the way, if I mention one more thing, you know, one issue about adaptation is forecasting. Our ability to forecast the fire weather now is immensely better than it was a few decades ago. Yeah. It will be immensely better in 20 years. In addition, our ability to spot fires as they start will be much, much greater. So that technological side could have a big impact. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to. Um, oh, Sean, hand raised. Yeah, I just um, wanted to quickly uh, reply, respond to a comment Dr. Mass made earlier about like a lot of the, these studies are Western US wide. Um, I, I just want to respond by saying actually most of the studies that I see, they, they are Western US wide and in presentations like this, we show the results Western US wide. But if you dig into the papers, including my own, we, we zoom in onto specific eco regions as well. And, and for, as a further refinement from what I've worked on and what some other people work on is we also limit our analyses to just forest. So we're, we're kind of excluding some of that, you know, some of that sheet grass some of that cheatgrass and stuff like that. So I just want to just point out that it's not only Western US wide studies that are not um, acknowledging that different ecosystems respond differently to, to climate or, or to humans. OK, good. Um, so let me say thank you to the three of you. It's been fun working with you. I thought your presentations were excellent. Um, let us just um, let you all know what's coming up next in these Fire Lab seminars. I'm going to share the slide here and um, let Natalie give a little advertisement. Natalie. <laughs> 
Yep. Thanks, Mahalem. So I just wanted to say thanks again real quick to all the presenters. Yeah, I thought the presentations were great. And thanks for spending an hour and a half with us and giving us your time today. Um, so this was the last seminar in the fall lineup. Um, our next seminar will be January 27th. Um, that'll be at the regular time from 11 to 12 Mountain Time. It's going to be from Patrick Murphy, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Washington, talking about high resolution meteorology during daily California wildfire. <clears throat> you can always see the full seminar schedule at the link here from firelab.org. And you can send uh, seminar ideas uh, to this email address here. Um, next semester, Chris Stalling is going to be taking over lead of the organizing the seminar series. So you can send your seminar ideas to her. All right. Thanks again. That's all I have, Nahalem. All right. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Sean, Alex, and Cliff. And just a big um, appreciation to everyone that spent um, their, their lunch hour um, here in the seminar with us. Uh, like I mentioned, this will be um, posted as a recording on the FireLab website. Um, if you want to watch it again for movie night or just share it with friends. So have a great uh, afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. Bye. Yeah.